Hello and welcome to the Terrell Museum Speaker Series Thursday. And today um, it's my uh, very great pleasure to introduce our last, um, uh, it's actually our last speaker of the series, um, and it is Dr. Aubrey Roberts. Now, Dr. Roberts uh, is currently a postdoc at the University of Oslo working on early Triassic bone beds at Svalbard. Her research looks into the recovery of ancient marine ecosystems after mass extinctions um, and how Mesozoic marine reptiles evolved and diversified. Now, Dr. Roberts' previous research has focused on um, Mesozoic marine reptiles with her doctorate at the University of Southampton focused on Jurassic long neck plesiosaurs from Svalbard and a master's in biology from the University of Oslo focused on Jurassic ichthyosaurs. She's a member of the Spitsbergen Mesozoic Research Group and has completed six field seasons of excavations in the Arctic of Svalbard. In addition, she is a trained fossil preparator and was named National Geographic Young Explorer in 2014. Um, that feels like a long time ago now. Um, her undergraduate degree is in biology from University of Oslo and the University Centre in Svalbard. She's also affiliated with the NHM in London as a scientific associate. So, uh, is it grim up north? Uh, let's find out and go over to Aubrey. Well, thank you very much for inviting me for this, um, for this uh, lecture series. I'm going to talk about some quite different things today. So I'm going to try something quite ambitious, which I haven't tried before, so it'll be quite um, fun. Um, I'm going to try and go through quite a large portion of the story of the history of life based off fossils that um, have been found from the Arctic archipelago of Svalbard. If you don't know where that is, I will get back to that in a minute. So, um, this is a very basic figure that I have uh, made, but I'm going to try and use it to sort of sum up the general concepts of the history of life in case you're uh, not very familiar. Um, so the story of life on our planet started with our planet's formation about 4.5 billion years ago. Um, and around sort of three and a half to four billion years ago is when scientists have estimated the first life to have sort of appeared. Um, sort of shown here by my very simple bacteria on the upper left hand uh, side of the slide. After that, we have sort of photosynthesis starting with cyanobacteria about three and a half billion years ago, and then eukaryotes or animal cells appear around two uh, billion years ago. And then followed by the earliest multicellular life. And that's when it starts to get interesting. So at the Cambrian explosion around 242 million years ago, marks the sort of appearance of many of the major animal lineages in the fossil record, marked here by my little trilobite. Um, and the reason for this is that it's largely due to the appearance of hard parts that allows for fossil preservation. Um, but after this, we start to see a lot more interesting things in, with more relevant to kind of our history, the history of the vertebrates. So in the Silurian and the Devonian, we saw the rise of, sort of fishes, um, fishes with bones, although quite a lot of them had bones on sort of the outside as armour. And they were also jawless to start off with. And in the Devonian, a group of these, or a group of these fish sort of started to evolve adaptations for um, living on land. And we have our first tetrapods appear on the scene about 375 million years ago, shown by my lovely little green amphibian uh, and sort of in the middle there. Um, from here, we have the appearance of the first egg-laying amniotes, so uh, the lineage that includes mammals and reptiles in the Carboniferous about 300 million years ago, and then through into the Mesozoic, the era of the dinosaurs, we have multiple different uh, groups of vertebrates appearing, including the dinosaurs, later the birds, and also mammals as well, leading all the way up to us. Well, that was a very brief history. And now I'm going to spend the rest of my talk showing you about how one place on earth captures a large part of this history, particularly the history for vertebrates, marked here in red even though these sort of might not be the most important of milestones, but they're still pretty cool and interesting fossils that show an important part of the evolution of vertebrates. 
So where is Svalbard? Some of you may have heard of it, particularly if you've read the fantasy series by Philip Pullman, His Dark Materials, where it was home to armoured polar bears. Now, they're not armoured, but they're definitely, it's definitely home to polar bears. Um, and in Svalbard, we find rocks from practically all the geological time periods that we sort of have from the Paleozoic to the Mesozoic to the Tertiary. And it's one of sort of one of the few places in the world where we can find fossils quite easily, mainly because the vegetation is very sparse. And this has amazed geologists since the first Norwegian geological expedition um, by Kjellhau in 19, uh, sorry, in 1827. And today, Svalbard is pretty popular for geologists and paleontologists around the world because it doesn't have any grass that covers up all of our beautiful fossils. Um, and Svalbard consists, it's an archipelago, so it, it consists of multiple islands. Um, the largest is Spitsbergen, and there are several smaller islands as well. Um, it has the northernmost settlement in the world, Longyearbyen, which is home to about two and a half thousand people. There are more polar bears than people up there. Um, used to be mainly coal mining and whaling, but now it's more sort of tourism and, and research for the people that live up there. Um, unlike mainland Norway, that have most of its interesting, well, I say interesting rocks scraped away by the ice cap during the ice age, Svalbard still documents a very large part of the Earth's history when it comes to the evolution of vertebrates. So just to sort of show you in a little bit more detail, um, we have uh, quite a large amount of rocks from different time eras uh, through that the Earth has been through. So the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic and the Tertiary. And I'm going to take you on a little journey through this. Um, obviously, for me, there will be more of a focus on the Mesozoic because that is my research area and it's where I have done the most field work and uh, have a lot more cool pictures of doing cool stuff in the field. So uh, the focus will be there, but I will talk about some really interesting fossils from uh, the other time eras as well. So starting off with the Paleozoic. So we'll start off with the oldest rocks. The basement rocks of Svalbard are it's sort of Ediacaran or Precambrian to Silurian of age. Um, and that aren't that many fossils, they're, like, they're, they're quite sort of rare compared to um, the sort of the older time periods. So um, not too many fossils of interest to show there. However, there are some pretty cool ones. Um, and one of the sort of the, the sort of some of the coolest fossils of these sort of ancient life forms, I think, are stromatolites. Now we have stromatolites today. Um, there's a picture to the right there of stromat stromatolites from Shark Bay in Australia. They're Stromatolites are basically representatives of the first macro fossils. Um, and they're made from cyano cyanobacteria, so microbial mats, which over time are deposited carbonate in layers. And it's really cool that these are tiny little organisms that have made these large sort of macro fossil structures. And we have these on Svalbard and they're found sort of multiple places all around the world as well. Um, other sort of pretty fossils, but Unfortunately, not, not the best. We do have quite a few trilobites and graptolites and brachiopods from the, um, the Ordovician and the Cambrian rocks of Svalbard. I've just picked out a few trilobites here that we have in our museum collections in Oslo. Although we don't have sort of a rich fossil record to show off the Cambrian explosion on Svalbard. Um, so the sort of this diversification event documented in the fossil record of sort of fossil hard parts. Um, we do have some pretty cool documentation of the next um, evolutionary milestone for vertebrates, which is kind of the diversification of fish. So on that side, it's pretty interesting. And it starts off with this little guy here. Um, so Anatole Lepis Heinze is one of the earliest sort of fossil fishes um, that you could call a, a proper fish with some bony structures. Um, so in 1975, a paleontologist, Torva Buckley, discovered uh, fossil pieces from an armoured shell of a primitive jawless fish, about 470 million years old from Svalbard. Um, and this fish was named Anatole Lepis uh, after a Norwegian expert in fossil fishes. 
And similar fossils have been found elsewhere in the world, up to about 510 million years old. So occurrences have been found of this fish in North America, Greenland and Spitsbergen, showing that it has a pretty widespread geographic distribution um, in the late Cambrian to early Ordovician marine environments, which is so it's a pretty widespread fish for such a tiny little thing. Um, and it has sort of these two, I've got a sort of a, a slight, <laughs> a, a, a basic drawing, shall we say, where it has sort of these armor plates, um, sort of dorsal and ventral, and it has sort of scales as well. Uh, and But it is quite a primitive fish in a sense. It doesn't have any fins. It only has a single gill opening. So it's still very sort of simple um, and uh, uh, sort of not, not what we think of as a fish. And of course, jawless, no jaws. But that story will continue into the Devonian for Svalbard, um, which documents a lot more of um, early fish evolution. So the Devonian stretches from about 419 to 358 million years ago. Um, and it's during this time that central parts of Spitsbergen sort of subsided and large amounts of sediments were basically just dumped um, on land and in sort of fresh and brackish waters. Um, and we have some of some pretty awesome armor plated fish uh, from these rocks, but and a lot of them are found in this sort of old red sandstone, as you can see from this um, image here. A bit more clearly here as well. The old red sandstone is pretty well known from other localities other than Svalbard. It's found in multiple places around the world. And these rocks are rich in iron compounds, making it sort of rusty red. And um, the Devonian was a period where sort of fish evolved extensively and sort of this is a very basic representation of some different relationships between groups of fish it's not a particularly correct representation but what it does show is that we have sort of jawless fish and we have jawed fish at the top of the tree there and the a lot of the fossils from the Devonian of Svalbard tell this story about jawless fish so fish without jaws there are some jawed fish as well in there but they're not as well preserved so I thought I'd focus on the these very strange bony armored um, jawless fish representatives and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes however their fossils are a little bit messy as you can tell from this image to the left here this is um, uh, one of the specimens that we have in the museum now there are multiple different types of jawless fish um, some of them are listed there on the on the right hand side um, they all sort of have these armored um, parts like either scales or armor plates so dorsal and ventral plates to protect their um, themselves from predation and some of the specimens that have been collected from Svalbard are quite pretty uh, and they do show sort of important um, well they're important representatives to this group so um, Doriaspis is one of these it's a heterostracan got dorsal and ventral plates which are quite easily preserved because they're quite sort of robust anyway um, and they're sort of here, you can see multiple different parts of these dorsal and ventral plates here. This part up here is a little bit messy, but yeah, they're quite little cute sort of fossil fish that could swim around, but weren't particularly amazing swimmers compared to maybe these guys, the Austriastrakens, which were a bit more fish-like, they're more advanced, they had paired fins, um, they had uh, sort of dorsal fins as well and quite a strong tail. Um, we have quite a few different uh, types of these found from Svalbard. They have very complex cranial anatomy and it was actually Stan Scher, uh, a paleontologist from Sweden that actually ground down quite a few of these osteostrakens from uh, Svalbard to sort of look into the cranial anatomy and could see sort of very interesting neural networks and all sorts of stuff going on inside um, their uh, skulls. But one of the little sort of highlights that I brought through here is Boreaspis. We have quite a few specimens of this at the museum. Um, it's a tiny little one, really small. Skull is only like a couple of centimeters long. Has quite a long rostrum that could have been used for, I, I mean, it's been hypothesized to be used to root out um, food buried in the substrate, substrate, all sorts of things. But beautiful little specimens and they're quite easily to spot in the red um, sandstone as well. So quite a cute, cute little guy. But that was basically the sort of the focusing on some of the, the sort of more uh, 
aquatic life. Um, but there was also quite a lot going on on land as well. Uh, and some of the paleo environments preserved in the Devonian outcrops on Svalbard are not just sort of from water, so freshwater or brackish waters, they're actually deltaic plains and river deposits. Um, and we actually have some of the first Devonian forests preserved um, from Svalbard as well. And the tree trunks of these um, sort of like copses or like club moss like um, trees have been described from Svalbard. There's sort of an image of them to the left hand side there. Um, I mean, they could be like four meters high. So these were giant trees uh, already in the Devonian. And it's been hypothesized that these sort of the appearance of these forests were one of the causes or could have been the cause of the drop in atmospheric carbon dioxide during the Devonian when the CO2 sort of level dropped from what it, it was high above the level we have today to a level more similar uh, of today. So um, pretty, pretty interesting forests and other sort of um, vegetation or flora, flora fossils that you can find um, from the Devonian as Svalbard are more sort of simple um, uh, I think xylophytes, I think that's what they're called. They're like true roots and leaves, um, but they're, they're still sort of uh, plants as you were. So um, fossils of early sort of tetrapods are rare. So I talked a little bit about um, in the start of the lecture that about this transition from a, a sort of a, a fish or sarcopterygian fish to living on land. So the earliest tetrapods and we have quite a lot of beautiful tetrapod fossils from these early tetrapods from the middle and late Devonian from, um, uh, from Greenland. However, we do not have any of these fossils on Svalbard, even though sort of geographically they're Greenland and Svalbard were reasonably close together at the time. Uh, the closest we have are some trackways from the Carboniferous from Bear Island, which is south of uh, the main archipelago. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have any amazing tetrapods, but it could be something that could be found in the future. So uh, cross our fingers for that. But moving on into the Carboniferous. So, pardon me, the Carboniferous of Svalbard is um, quite sort of spread out throughout the entire archipelago. It's not focused just in Spitsbergen, and it has been um, researched quite extensively mainly because it is very, very rich in coal. And obviously coal was one of the historically, one of the sort of more interesting um, economic incentives to go and, and live and, and, and stay on Svalbard. Now the Carboniferous period in general was quite humid um, and the deposits from the Carboniferous and Svalbard were formed from low-lying uh, low wetlands and rivers, floodplains, lakes and swamps. And sand, clay and plant remains from the swamps gave rise to sort of the sandstone, slate and layers of coal mix. Um, and we get some really rich sort of coal reserves which have been uh, historically sort of uh, excavated on Svalbard. But we also get some pretty interesting fossils as well. Lots of different um, fossils of plants, of course. Uh, these sort of like scale trees, um, as similar to Lycopsis again, and also lots of sort of tree root fossils as well. But obviously the more sort of uh, quite an interesting side effect of all of these um, swamps and forests are of, is of course the cult. Um, and I thought I'd just add a little bit of history in here just because it's it's quite interesting. So most of the world's coal resources are from sort of the upper Carboniferous, but actually some of the coal that's on Svalbard is some of the world's oldest and unfortunately it is quite poor quality. But because there is a large amount of it, um, Svalbard has been quite, uh, has a long history of mining and there are old abandoned mines all over uh, Svalbard. And this picture here is of a place called Pyramiden, which is actually a old abandoned Russian town um, where they mined coal uh, since the 1920s. And they uh, got up and left um, uh, when the coal started to run out in, I think it was the uh, 90s, I believe. And they, the settlement is completely abandoned. 
and it's a really interesting and creepy place to visit so I would recommend um, visiting it if you are in Svalbard because it's it's an amazing place to just sort of see this abandoned town I haven't I haven't seen uh, any other ghost town so it's very interesting going to visit there uh, but yeah absolutely recommend it Okay, so after the Carboniferous, the sea level rose and it's sort of, there are only a few islands left of Svalbard and the Permian successions on Svalbard document rich marine life, particularly invertebrate. Um, and these mountains here are, a lot of them uh, consist of Permian uh, sediments. They're very hard rock. And the reason for this is because of silica sponges or sort of silica um, so the sea is sort of cool uh, at this time, and it basically resulted in sort of blooming of these sort of micro um, silica animals, which created a lot of shirt. And these are very, very hard rocks, which form very steep cliffs on the mountains of Svalbard, where these sort of sponge spiracles can, I don't know, make up like 60, 70 percent of the rock. So it's really, really hard, not easy to work with at all. Um, and it sort of it's quite rarely that you observe that tiny little animals and bloomings of a single dominant organism can produce a distinct rock type so even the smallest organism can change the course of the future or even form mountains so it's pretty pretty uh, impressive however it is very hard to sort of study the fossils that are in these mountains because the rock is so hard and hard to get to and um, so I won't be talking too much about the different Permian uh, invertebrates because this lecture is more focused on the vertebrates. So uh, obviously one thing that we might think of when it comes to the Permian is the end Permian mass extinction, um, which is one of my research interests. So the Permian Triassic mass, mass extinction or PTME um, was a major mass extinction event. Now, this graph here is just a very simplified um, version of the famous graph that sort of shows the amount, number of families, so it's a taxonomic level through time. Um, we can see sort of numerous fluctuations in the graph that indicate extinction and diversification events. Uh, the most famous of these is, of course, the KPG of extinction, which caused the extinction of all the non-avian dinosaurs. Um, however, the largest is the M Permian mass extinction, where it's sort of estimated that 80, 90 percent of all marine species became extinct, um, which completely sort of disrupted the entire or many ecosystems um, on our planet. And whole sort of groups completely disappeared at the end of the Permian. So things like trilobites, Eurytrids, all sorts of uh, other invertebrates and vertebrates as well um, disappeared. And it was the final stop for a lot of these groups. But it did open up the possibilities for the survivors to diversify. And that's what we actually see in the early Triassic record, particularly on Svalbard. And it helps us understand how the M Permian mass extinction resulted in the evolution of particularly Triassic marine communities many of which still dominate Earth's oceans today. So the reptiles that we find in the uh, early Triassic, particularly on Svalbard, a lot of these are sort of marine reptiles, um, are a great example of this sort of rapid diversification after mass extinction. Basically, you wipe out everything, got loads of new sort of open niches that they can explore. So into the Triassic. So these are the black marine shales of the Triassic of Svalbard. At the time, uh, Svalbard was located quite far north, um, not as far north as it is today, but still pretty far north. The Red Star indicates that. Um, and I worked together with a group of researchers, um, students, academics, volunteers. We're led by Jörn Hurum, who's at the, the sort of the back left hand side um, there. And we've been going many uh, seasons to Svalbard to excavate uh, in Mesozoic era age rocks, Triassic and Jurassic. Uh, in particular. And our more recent focus has been bone beds from the early Triassic. And Svalbard has quite a long history of exploration. These um, sort of rich, bone rich layers were first discovered actually in the sort of mid late 1800s. 
um, but we have sort of revived them and collected more material. Um, and these three are sort of bone beds from the early Triassic, which show this sort of recovery of the ecosystem after the M Permian mass extinction. Um, and it's this one in particular, which has been sort of the main study. And when I talk about bone beds, I basically mean any vertebrate that lived in or around the sea, put through a washing machine and sort of mixed up all together. So none of these are complete specimens. They're all mixed up. We, we have to sort of identify each individual bone. My main interest has been looking into the grippier bone bed to understand the early evolution of uh, a marine reptile called ichthyosaurs, which are these sort of dolphin-like marine reptiles, which basically were around for a lot of the, the tri Triassic, Jurassic, and most of the Cretaceous as well, to be fair. Um, just indicating the red square, these sort of the middle part of this early Part of this tree is of interest to me. These are obviously secondarily aquatic, meaning that they have a land living ancestor that we don't know much about. Um, so that's also sort of an interesting part of the story. But field work on Svalbard is very beautiful. It, we may not have a lot of grass, but it is still quite green. We have lots of moss and other things, but it is um, still very easy to collect fossils there. All of these black sort of dark outcrops there, Triassic um, outcrops um, coming out. So we spent our days sort of searching the mountainsides for these bone beds. Uh, we did eventually find them and we just excavated particularly the grippier bone bed level. Uh, we took out the entire bone bed to take back to the lab and sort of analyze. So basically collected everything in plastic bags and plaster jackets so that we would get the smallest things and the largest things. And an example of one of these things that we collected, um, this is just a picture from the field, is a hyperdont um, spine. So one of the little fin spines. Uh, it's basically what it looks like in the bone bed, but uh, we sort of found all sorts of shapes and sizes of bones, thousands and thousands and thousands of individual bones from all sorts of animals all mixed together. And when I say all sorts of animals, I mean all sorts of animals. So fish, sharks, um, some unknown reptile that we're not sure, but it could be an archosaur. Uh, amphibians, so marine amphibians, also really weird that they exist anyway. Um, who would have thought that amphibians could live in salt water, but hey. Uh, and also ichthyosaurs. So all of these animals all mixed together. And they actually made quite a diverse ecosystem, which was really interesting because this appeared is it's only four to five million years after this M Permian mass extinction. And we still, well, then have like top predators and all sorts. So um, this is a really interesting bone bed to study. And uh, we've got so much more um, to go through and work on with this layer. But going on into the sort of the middle Triassic, we also have lots of other different types of ichthyosaurs as well. These more sort of um, advanced uh, mixosaurs, and they unfortunately are very flat most of the time. Um, this is one of them. You can see the blue here is actually bone. The black is the shale. Um, the bones on Svalbard from the Triassic actually turn blue. It's because there's a reaction that happens when the bones um, sort of come into contact with water and oxygen and vivianite forms, which is a blue sort of mineral. Uh, very beautiful to look at and also very easy to spot in the black shale. And um, they also have seem to be quite rich in minerals on the inside of their bones as well, which means that they x-ray really well, as you can see from this sort of specimen on the right hand side here. Um, and we also have CT scanned a few specimens, which one which was recently published um, to sort of try and understand more about mixosaurs and how they sort of fit in into the ichthyosaur tree of life. So um, that's research that we're still continuing at the moment. And there's still loads more mixosaurs to sort of work out. They all seem to be pretty, pretty, pretty small, but yeah, interesting little beasties nonetheless. Now, I've talked quite a lot about the Triassic, but we have actually done a significant amount of work on the Jurassic. And this project is pretty much um, finished. It sort of started in 2004 and basically continued until recently, um, where uh, the team that I'm a part of from the University of Oslo went up to Svalbard and excavated um, marine reptiles from the upper Jurassic sediments of Svalbard. Svalbard at the 
time was still marine, like there wasn't any sort of land masses too nearby. And we have quite a lot of marine reptiles from this locality. It's still quite far north, um, not as far north as it is today, but um, at this locality, we find fossils of ichthyosaurs again, but more sort of the most advanced ones, the ophthalmosaurid ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. So the short necked, big headed ones, the pliosaurs and the long necked, um, small headed ones, the long necked plesiosaurs in this instance, cryptoclidids. And we have over um, six field seasons there excavated over 60 specimens of ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. So a significant amount. Yeah, so at the end of the tree is this, these sort of ophthalmosaurid ichthyosaurs. Uh, and there's been quite a lot of history um, from, uh, from this locality as well. It was first discovered in the 1930s by some American doctors that excavated a plesiosaur while they were sort of on, on a sort of a trip to study the common cold. And no one actually went back to the, that locality till we went there. And we excavated these 60 specimens. This is just uh, an image from one mountainside where we have multiple specimens of plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs excavated in a small area. Now, this is not normal paleontology. Normal paleontology is walking for kilometers and not finding bones. We are incredibly lucky with this really rich fossil site. And the field work here is really fun. Like you walk around the mountains, you find these like bones sticking out of the black shale, really easy to see. You brush them down um, sort of to try and find out, oh, is this a complete specimen? Oh, is this like um, not sort of, uh, is this just a few disarticulated ribs? And quite often these are complete specimens more than not, or at least partially complete. This is a skull of an ichthyosaur. Um, unfortunately, some of the, the holes that we have to dig to excavate these are pretty deep. And also this is permafrost. So the ground is frozen once you get down to a certain level. So it's really sort of hard work trying to like dig out these specimens by hand. And we get incredibly muddy. And um, that is actually clean water that I'm drinking. It's not dirty water, um, but it is really fun. And I think I've got a video. Let's see if it works of some of the excavation that we have. So yeah, quite, um, tricky excavation, shall we say. And once we sort of separated out specimens, we quite often have to split them into different parts for size. Um, we actually cover them in uh, wet toilet paper and then plaster, I'm sure paleontologists uh, um, sort of, well, it's a common practice around the world with big fossils to use plaster and toilet paper in this way. Um, so we cover them in plaster, it is really hard to get plaster to dry properly in conditions like this. This is August, by the way, it still snows. It, you're in the Arctic, you get random weather. Um, we actually use a special type of plaster that does um, uh, dry a bit easier. Then we have to separate these uh, plaster jackets with the specimens in from the permafrost below. Obviously it's quite easy when everything's frozen anyway. So we just have to basically cut it with giant chisels. And then these plaster jackets are transported out by helicopter and back to Oslo where they're prepared in the laboratory. And some of these specimens that we collected are absolutely beautiful. Our most complete ichthyosaur that we have is Cryptrygius christiansenae. Um, although it could be Undurosaurus, which is a Russian um, species, there's still a bit of debate about that. Um, but it is a, a beautiful specimen on display uh, at the moment with, it's pretty much complete apart from the tip of the tail. So a beautiful, uh, if not slightly broken specimen. All of our specimens are unfortunately broken due to um, the freeze thaw processes of the permafrost. Our best plesiosaur and my favorite is this one. It's a long neck plesiosaur, which we excavated in 2012, nicknamed Brittany. It's called Ophthalma thule creostea, and it's the only plesiosaur that we have with a complete skull. Um, so it's uh, pretty, this is the sort of a CT rendering of the skull here. 
um, huge eyes for a plesiosaur. Those are the big holes at the top of the, the skull there. Um, but a beautiful little specimen. It's about five and a half meters long. Skull was 21 centimeters. So not, not a huge, huge skull. We also have some giant pliosaurs, not as common as the other ones, obviously, because they are the top predators in the sea, but still pretty big beasties of about 10 to 13 meters. And we have two specimens of those. So um, pretty, pretty cool animals. But we don't just have um, uh, vertebrates. There are also cool invertebrates from these uh, layers on Svalbard. We have actually uh, sort of a special Lagerstatten, so um, like a really fossiliferous layer a storm deposit full of echinoderms, which don't starfish don't usually fossilize very well. So we have some beautiful starfish fossils, which are some of these I can show here. And there's a sea urchin on the left-hand side there as well. Also home to methane seeps, which are sort of, if you're familiar with like black smokers under the sea, um, you have some very specific life forms that live there. We also have fossilized versions of these, which are quite cool, where you find we found all sorts of really interesting um, marine fauna that has either lived around or in the seep itself. And the specimens are cell, uh, themselves do have some interesting preservation. And this is due to partially, we think, the seeps. A lot of the bones are actually filled with a, quite a rare mineral called barite, um, which has helped preserve uh, a lot of the specimens in three dimensions. So um, you can see this blue uh, on the left hand side is actually barite, which is sort of filling in the pores of these bones um, and helping to keep them from not getting squished like we saw from our flat mixosaurs from the Triassic. Anyway, very sort of interesting preservation due to these methane seeps. And I couldn't sort of talk about Svalbard and not talk about polar bears for a tiny bit. So there are polar bears there. And when we do work in the field, we obviously have to be really careful working around them because um, it is their habitat. Um, and we don't actually camp anymore because there are too many polar bears that are too close to um, people right now. So it's not, not safe to camp on Svalbard at the moment, unfortunately. Um, but they, it is their home, so we've got to respect that. But they are beautiful animals. All right, so we're finished with the Triassic and the Jurassic. So onto the Cretaceous. So we're moving away from the marine realm, moving to more terrestrial um, and deltaic sandstones and nearshore marine. So a bit more land living vertebrates, a lot less of the sea ones. So we're still quite far north, but we are on land. Um, there was quite a lot of volcanic activity in the Cretaceous. The world was really warm. Um, and we have sort of dinosaurs all over the place. And we also have them on Svalbard as well. Um, we don't have any bones, but we do have an awful lot of footprints um, from the sort of the earliest part of the Cretaceous. Unfortunately, the late, latest part of the Cretaceous isn't preserved on Svalbard. Um, this is a really lovely site on Eastern Svalbard where we have um, a whole sort of herd of, of dinosaurs preserved as footprints. You can see all of these sort of round splodges here on this um, sort of sandstone there, all dinosaur footprints. If we look up closely, some of these look like this. And um, these are sort of, we have some front legs and back leg impressions uh, without sort of this hind claw so they're not from a theropod dinosaur but they're actually from a plant eater so similar to like a something like an iguanodon and um, there are lots of different types of tracks different sizes uh, so it could be an entire herd or something similar but it's um we have them at multiple sites as well so quite a lot of these beautiful little um dinosaurs well not so little but we do have one little mystery uh femur and that's this one. This was actually found by sort of by chance um, in the museum collections when we were moving building. Uh, it's only preserved because it is preserved inside a shell. Uh, there are no other known bones from this formation. So it's kind of strange that we have this one singular bone <laughs> preserved inside this giant shell. Um, anyway, what we could tell by CT scanning the specimen is that it is hollow all the way through. Um, meaning that it could, based on the anatomy, it could be one of two things. It could be a bird or it could be an avialan uh, sort of lineage dinosaur or something like a, 
similar to an, an Archaeopteryx or, or closer to birds than that. So we're not entirely sure what this is, but it's the only bone that we have um, from a sort of dinosaur lineage on Svalbard yet. We're hoping for more one day. So to finish off uh, this section, we move on to the sort of the tertiary, the Paleocene and the Eocene of Svalbard. Um, the encretaceous sediments are missing on Svalbard completely, but we do have some lovely uh, successions from the Paleocene and the Eocene, starting off with some really cool footprints. Um, so a lot of the coal mined on Svalbard is from the Carboniferous, but the stuff that is around Longyearbyen is all from the Paleocene. And while they were mining, uh, they actually discovered this amazing trackway. Um, you can see uh, it was on the roof or the well, roof ceiling of one of these mines. And uh, these have been identified as belonging to a pantodont, which is, is an extinct group of eutherium mammals. So that's also the group that includes placental mammals, so us. And these herbiferous mammals were some of the first groups of large mammals to evolve after the end of the Cretaceous. And they could weigh, I think some of them weighed up to like 500 kilos. So pretty big animals. I mean, you can tell from that footprint, it's, they're, they're pretty huge. Um, and basically what happened is this sort of pantodont come along, squidged down some swampy moss, uh, which later turned to coal and the footprints filled with sandstone. So they were preserved. Uh, really interesting and beautiful footprints. One of the, or some of the most beautiful fossils I think we actually have from Svalbard are from our, or the Eocene forests. Um, and basically these are fossil leaves and branches from many different species of tree and plants um, from the area. So basically anything from hazel and lime trees to ferns and horse tails, it's kind of weird finding a fossilized forest as somewhere that doesn't have any trees anymore. It's, it's really beautiful. And I mean, this image is basically sort of summarizes what it, could have looked like in the Eocene. And these are just some of the beautiful, they're so well preserved, these um, plant fossils. Anything from like sort of cypress uh, to horsetails to redwoods, all sorts of different trees, um, absolutely beautiful, stunning fossils. Uh, so then they're really close to Longyearbyen. So if you ever go to Longyearbyen, it's you just walk up the sort of riverbed and there you have plant fossils all eroding out from the mountains. So an absolutely, um, absolutely fantastic fossils. Right, I think that basically is the end of my talk. So I'd just like to thank you all sponsors and volunteers and Yearn in particular for helping me with some of the slides. Um, I would definitely recommend taking a look at the, at the book Making of a Land, which is about the um, geological history of Svalbard and Norway, if you're interested in more information, or our web pages. And also I spam lots of Svalbard related stuff on my Twitter. So Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed this lecture. And I'm pretty sure there are some questions um, for me to answer. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, a wonderful romp. And I'm very pleased that uh, you gave uh, probably the, the highest profile of fish that we've had in the speaker series uh, this year. So, so thanks for that on a personal uh, basis. Um, before we get into the questions, um, uh, it does behoove me, uh, it's always a good verb to use on a Thursday, it behooves me to uh, note that this is the last uh, speaker in our speaker series this year, um, as sponsored by the Rotterell Museum Cooperating Society. Um, and so we should do uh, some thank yous. Um, in particular, the Walter Royal Museum for hosting a speaker series and, of course, again, the cooperating society, especially Paddy Rolrick, for funding the speaker series, making this transition to live online webinars possible. Um, it, it's been an interesting time, uh, I think, about a, a week after um, uh, we arrived in, in Drumheller, there was the last in-person talk by Yasmina Riemann, and that was back in March. 2020. So um, uh, since then, it's been very much a, a move to uh, hit the ground running and do the virtual seminar series, which we've done for the last couple of years now. Um, and we really couldn't have done that without uh, a, a, a lot of support within the institution. Um, in particular, 
uh, first and foremost, I have to say uh, Keegan Berry and Ken Elspeth for learning how to use Zoom on extremely short notice and running the technical aspects of the webinars absolutely flawlessly every week. Um, we were all sort of like uh, strangers in a strange land when this started off and, and, and they've just been amazing. Um, also, uh, Amanda Brown, Wendy Taylor, and Elaine Secord for their involvement in advertising the speaker series, the social media posts, uh, and setting up the Zoom registration pages, um, as well as um, uh, my colleagues, uh, Jim Gardner and Caleb Brown, uh, helping uh, Francois Terrier um, in inviting guest speakers and taking on new hosting duties associated with running webinars and exciting new technology, which has uh, all been a little bit uh, perhaps too thrilling at times. Um, also the design studio at the Trail Museum for designing the, the graphics that appear at the beginning and the end of the webinars. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, uh, jawline, uh, as you can see, not as, as one uh, of our uh, guests thought it, it was actually the hoodoos. The hoodoos look quite different. Um, and again, all the speakers for taking time away from their busy schedule to present captivating talks every uh, uh, week. Um, uh, this this year alone, we've uh, we've had frogs, salamanders, snakes, dinosaurs, birds, cave bears, hobbits, Neanderthals, and Donald Trump, all as uh, paleontological uh, uh, subjects in our speaker series, and uh, it's uh, been very very wide ranging. So again, I'm grateful to Aubrey for bringing in some uh, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and fish at the end there. Um, we, uh, we've had an uh, uh, audience uh, going up to uh, 70 connections per talk through this season, and we consider that a very great uh, success. And uh, um, we will um, be back next year, hopefully in a more physical uh, sense. Uh, but first of all, uh, let's uh, go back to some questions. Um, I have, uh, we have a, a series, I don't know if you can see the questions there, Aubrey. Um, but uh, we, uh, we have a, another couple uh, purely from, for me abusing my own position to ask. Um, uh, the plaster jacketing that you were doing in the field for the Jurassic material, could you tell me what was it that you were using as support struts? Um, I mean, having done the one or two plaster jackets my, myself, I was particularly struck by the whole thing that you actually had to have something strong enough so that you lifted it out by helicopter and it wouldn't just fall apart. Uh, and I know some of the uh, plaster jackets that uh, I've been involved in uh, would sort of look like they were going to deposit their contents as soon as you looked at them. I mean, was it was it metal or was it wood that you were using inside the jackets to support them? Uh, both. So burlap to begin with, which is like this yeah. rope mesh. And then um, we used bits of wood that we had. And also I think uh, we brought actually leftover like shelving units from shops that we cut up into metal bits and stuffed in there basically um just to help support the the weight because obviously these things are quite heavy um but being frozen also helps sort of keep their structural integrity a little bit better <laughs> that's kind of cheating but <laughs> a little bit <laughs> no that's that's good okay uh i've got another question to come back to but uh first of all um i should uh uh, deal with uh, some of um, uh, so on's. So this is going to be kind of in chronological order, I guess. Um, apart from Anatolipus Heintzai from the Horde Division, are there any other basal agnathans like conodonts from the Horde Division and any evidence for crown group chordates from the Cambrian? From Svalbard, there's not a lot of stuff from the Cambrian at all. Um, there mm. are some conodonts, I think, from um, there are some from the earlier Middle Ordovician, but most of that material is actually a lot older. There's a lot more um, conodont material from the Permian and the Triassic of Svalbard. Um, there's like there isn't a huge amount of early Paleozoic uh, fossils at all from Svalbard. They're quite rare. In comparison to a lot of the older, uh, sorry, younger Paleozoic stuff. Okay. In the Devonian paleo environment, many Agnathans are small. So what organized organisms occupied higher trophic positions, uh, essentially acting as keystone predators? Well, uh, 
I don't know much about that, but I would imagine the arthropods did. <laughs> um, and also larger um, jawed vertebrates as well when we get that far. Um, but we don't have that many jawed vertebrate fossils from Svalbard from the Devonian. There are some um, uh, placoderms, mm -hmm. but they are very fragmented and not very pretty. So I didn't include them, but we do have some from, I think they're from the late Devonian. But yes. are, they, are they diagnosable at all then to, or are they just too fragmentary for that? They're, they're not very pretty. <laughs> I would okay. have to say, I would have no idea how to diagnose those, but maybe a placoderm expert would, would recognize uh, what, what they are, but right. I, I wouldn't know um, as a non-fish expert. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Veering over into the, the, the plant realm, uh, any prototaxites present in carboniferous deposits? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I think, I'm not sure where, there are some prototaxis from Svalbard, but I don't think they're from the carboniferous. I think they're older. Um, they, might, they must be from the Devonian. But yeah, okay. not, not that I'm aware of anyway, not from the, the carboniferous. Okay. I could um, be wrong though. Absolutely. This is not my uh, field of expertise, so they could be there. Sorry, I can't answer that question. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I was just thinking of the prototaxites that, that I know um, in, in Scotland, and I think they're older than carboniferous as well. Um, anyway, um, the white shirt bands seen in the Permian deposits are they solely attributed to siliceous sponges or can coccolithophore blooms be a possible input? Um, suggesting a comparison with the White Cliffs of Dover. So I guess as, as the crossover person between the two environments, you're the perfect person to ask that to this hobby. I'm pretty sure they're just from, sil uh, from sponges, um, but I, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure they're just from sponges because they're only from these spiracles um as far as i'm aware okay um any pattern is there any pattern which suggests a periodic increase and decrease in ichthyosauriform concentration hinting at a possibility of breeding ground or wintering grounds given permians valbards northern latitudes Ooh. um no, well, there's, there, there's no evidence for that, at least. Um, but I mean, the fossil record isn't really sort of uh, resolved I think you mean enough Jurassic. to show that. Yeah. yeah, bit, um, yeah. From the Jurassic, it's slightly better. But at the same time, these animals were uh, capable of living in high latitude environments. They were reasonably sort of, they had a high metabolism, they could live in cold water. So um, compared to crocodiles and turtles, which we don't find on Svalbard from the Jurassic, by the way, um, they could survive easier. So I doubt they would have sort of, they've been there seasonally, they probably would have been there all year round. Um, okay. But it is hard to tell with the fossil record resolution. On the uh, Jurassic focus, um... Is it Colovian in term? It looked like it was Middle Jurassic material, but is it uh, what? What's what age is it within the Jurassic? Or what's Tithonian. The Tithonian. Okay, right. It's That's it's upper. It's late Jurassic, but there is some Colovian um, material as well. It's just not as nice. It's uh, it's very fragmentary and it's quite rare compared to the Tithonian stuff. But there are there is Colovian stuff, and I, there's actually even some lower Jurassic ichthyosaurs as well. Okay. Um, but they're uh, quite rare and also only on the eastern part, which is not as accessible. Okay. And uh, in the middle and upper Jurassic, amongst the, the very rich marine reptile fauna that you have there, um, any anomalous fish bones there by any chance? Just, you know, uh, asking for a friend, you know, large fish bones. N not large ones, very, very tiny fish bones. Um, okay. The only fish bones we found that are sort of nice to look at. I say nice, that they're not very nice. They're in uh, drill cores from the area. Okay. Um, and there was a paper by uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Micah Cuevoetz. Um, she uh, published on these um, fishes from the drill cores. But yeah, I, I can't exactly remember the name that she sort of limited the, the family to, but they're not your big fish, unfortunately. 
Sorry. Okay. That's cool. No, it's, uh, that's, uh, that makes it cheaper, so that's good. Um, Catherine Hope asks, uh, do you ever find evidence of invertebrates colonizing the marine reptile skeletons? Ah, possibly, I think is the answer to that question. Um, around a lot of the specimens from the Jurassic, we do find uh, quite a lot of, in, for some of the specimens, a lot of bivalves that could have been encrusting, but it's kind of hard to, to say. Um, there have also been some possible bore holes in the bones themselves, but because these are so fragmentary in the sense that they're burst by all these freeze thaw um, processes of the permafrost, it's quite hard to tell sometimes. Um, so I would answer that with possible evidence, but not clear evidence. Yeah, I think um, I was thinking of sort of examples that I've um, I'd, I'd come across and usually the, to see the little scrape marks or things like that on the surface of the bone you need a kind of nicely preserved bone and to start with in order to be able to see the, the, the imperfections are coming from that rather than um, difficult preservation um, okay uh, we have uh, another question from Sindar um, is symbiosis preserved in fossil specimens attributed to the hydrothermal vents as symbiosis is commonplace in modern black smokers. Um, that's citing Campbell in 2006 and Crispin Little. I don't know if you come across anything like that. I would not know the answer to that question off the top of my head. However, um, it was Crispin Little that described a lot of the material from our um, methane seeps along with uh, Krzysztof Hivinievich. Uh, so I'm sure if there was any um, symbiosis reported, they would have included it in the uh, publications, uh, which should all be open access and available. So I would recommend looking it up there. I do not know the answer to that question, unfortunately. Okay, it's cool. Um, Nectar uh, says, um, amazing talk, thank you. May I ask what your favorite species of fossil fish is? Um, honestly, that's not a question for me. <laughs> well, I kind of have to answer it that it's Leeds Ichthys, right? No, that's, that's a very good answer. That's an excellent <laughs> yeah. answer. Um, it like is, it some... is the biggest one, so. Yeah, okay, there you go. That's, that's a good answer. That's an excellent answer. Best one for the series. Um, Clinton uh, asks, uh, he says, I'd always assumed that the old red sandstone was a non-marine deposit. If so, are the primitive fish that you found it in freshwater species? And I think they were marine, aren't they? Or not? Yeah, so, uh, so I was confused by this as well, to be honest, when I was um, researching this. And I didn't get a completely clear answer, but there is a lot of, uh, a lot of the environments are sort of near shore and brackish um so i think that a lot of the specimens come from these sort of shallow marine environments that are preserved there rather than the very clear um sort of terrestrial deposits uh, but yeah that did confuse me so i'm not going to be 100 percent sure in my answer there but i'm pretty sure that they are marine as far as i'm aware these um egg nathan uh fishes okay um yes and i i know what he means in, in in terms of traditional old red sandstone yeah. like in scotland then that would be fresh water but uh perhaps not in this case clinton also asks um with the siliceous permian formations uh they sound like they'd be correlated to similar deposits in the permian of texas and new mexico that are petroleum bearing are there hydrocarbons in the svalbard permian deposits and i think you you mentioned the uh the coal as an option um uh, Permian coal, is that right? Uh, not so much Permian coal. I do actually yeah. think there is some oil from Permian. There's coal in the Carboniferous of Svalbard. Um, so uh, I would imagine that if this was in an... Now, I'm not a petroleum geologist, but uh, it, they, the oil could have come from the Carboniferous, but sort of be um, a, a reservoir in the in the Permian. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that could be the case. I think there might have been some oil... Uh, but a lot more of the Permian deposits are more terrestrial. No, hang on. No, they are marine. I'm getting mixed up. Yes, that I think there might be, but there is more oil and hydrocarbons from the Triassic uh, in particular. Uh, and 
the Jurassic uh, outcrops. Okay. Um, so yes, well in, intuited uh, there, Clinton. Um, Sender asks, um, in the taphonomy of the Jurassic marine deposits, is it like an anoxic environment or are there any turbidites or is there anything that you can say about, about that? Yeah, it's, uh, we've sort of worked out that it's disoxic. So it had, it was basically cyclical. So it had some anoxic periods, some oxic periods. Um, one of the sort of the reasonings behind this is that the fact that we do have this um, echinoderm ligerstatten, which shows that the bottom was populated by sort of quite a lot of benefic species, at least at some point, but then we're all sort of covered during a storm deposit event. Um, but yeah, cyclical, I would say, not, not completely anoxic, not completely oxic either. Okay. Cool. This is also based um, off isotopes as well. Okay, cool. Uh, Clinton asks, do you find any stomach contents in the skeletons of the large marine reptiles? Uh, yes, some. Although it is quite hard to quite often determine what is stomach content and what isn't. Um, we have, I think, found... Um, there was an ammonite inside one of the ichthyosaurs. Whether this was sort of just preserved with the ichthyosaur was, I think, discussed in the paper. But yeah, I think some fish scales and fish bits have been found in some of the ichthyosaurs. Nothing in the plesiosaurs, as far as I'm aware. I don't think we found any um, clear uh, stomach content remains there at all um, from any of the plesiosaur specimens. Okay. Um, coming up potentially to our last questions here, um, Sanders asks, uh, are all the Gryphia specimens of the same biological age at the time of preservation? So I, 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 I think uh, he's asking, is it, you know, are they all juveniles or are they all adults or? Um, we actually, so the grippier material, which is disarticulated from this grippier bone bed layer is from all different ages. So we actually have something that looks almost like uh, sort of very, very young individuals to possibly not even born yet individuals um, to older individuals. We have a whole size series actually of uh, humerus, so humeri um, from grippier uh, from this bone bed which is quite interesting so all different ages and this is also for a lot of the other ichthyosaurs as well different size classes so old individuals young individuals large small yeah okay um clinton uh as a follow-up on the permian question uh these so he points out that the tight siliceous rocks can be self-sourcing for oil if you give them a whack with a hammer, you should get a strong petroleum odor, which is why fracking is required for commercial production. So that's a, that's a suggestion for the next time that you're in the field is uh, whack one with a hammer and uh, and see if you get a smell of petroleum. I'm totally going to do that. <laughs> Excellent. You definitely get that from any of the Triassic rocks. You whack them and they stink of like petrol station. <laughs> right. Okay. Um Sender asks, apart from the benthic biological indicators, were there any chemical or physical proxies that you use to predict the cyclical pattern of dysoxia? I believe um, Ivan Hammer did a significant amount of work on the different isotopes present, which showed some of the, um, the, the sort of the cyclical uh, oxic, dysoxic, so oxic anoxic events um but yes that that would be what we we used i don't i'm not aware of anything else that we use beyond the sort of the biological ones and the these isotope indicators well unless there's any last minute questions that get in under the door um uh, i would take the opportunity to say thank you again to dr roberts uh um, for having the, the time to go through a series of extremely interesting questions, as well as taking the time to um, uh, generate that presentation 
uh, for us as a, as a guinea pig test population. That was, that was really good to do. Um, and uh, thank, I'd like to thank the audience for turning up for this as, as with the other weeks. Um, this talk um, concludes the 2022 edition of the Royal Terrell Museum Speaker Series as sponsored by the Terrell Museum Cooperating Society. Um, so yeah, everybody out there stay safe and healthy. And we hope to see you again next window, winter for the 2023 edition and uh, um, maybe a slightly more physical version of that uh, of a presentation series. So thanks again, and thanks again to Aubrey, and um, cheers. Thank you.